So now what we're going to do is to start to use this chemical synapse. Um, so this is the figure that comes right after this. This was basically structure of the chemical synapse. Now we're going to be looking at function of the chemical synapse. In addition, I want you to know that there is um, a kind of a, a, a long animation right here that's posted for you that hopefully you'll be able to open. It's like three minutes long. It goes through the stuff really slowly and carefully. I recommend that you watch it. I've got a shorter one to use when I'm talking to you though. Okay, so let's just go through this and then we'll make it wiggle and I'll show you an animation of this. So this is my chemical synapse and um, remember the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neurons are separated by this space called the synaptic cleft and the synaptic cleft is here and it will be filled with interstitial or extracellular fluid. Same type of thing separates a neuron from a muscle or a neuron from a gland cell in neuromuscular junctions and neuroglandular junctions. Now, if I have an action potential here and I want an action potential here, that's what I was trying to accomplish, the action potential can't jump across the space because do you guys remember that an action potential is an event that occurs on a cell membrane? So, right, it's a depolarization, really fast, um, positive feedback depolarization that occurs on a cell membrane. So the thing is that if I wa had an action potential here and I wanted an action potential here, I, I can't, the action potential doesn't jump the space. If there's no cell membrane, there's no action potential. So you, you can't have it jump the space because an action potential exists on a cell membrane. So instead, what we have to do is kind of restart exactly what had happened over here. Um, the synaptic cleft has to be bridged with chemicals. And of course, what kind of chemicals are released by a neuron right next to their receptor? Those are called neurotransmitters, okay? So basically now we say that when the action potential um, reaches the axon terminal of the presynaptic neuron, I'm reading here and I'm following here, what happens is it causes the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels on the presynaptic neuron. We're still on the presynaptic neuron. And then calcium moves into the presynaptic neuron. And it's that increase in calcium concentration that triggers exocytosis of the neurotransmitter from the presynaptic neuron. Now, you just do exocytosis of whatever neurotransmitter was there. So if the neurotransmitter was acetylcholine, that's what you would do exocytosis with. There's a bunch of others we'll learn, GABA, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, there's tons. But generally, there's exceptions, but generally, again, a neuron is going to make, store, and release a single neurotransmitter. Unfortunately, they did find a couple of neurons that make, store, and release more than one, but we still don't know how they decide which one to release. So we're going to pretend that that's not happening right here. Okay, so the neurotransmitter is going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft, and that's what we're seeing right here. And then the neurotransmitter is going to bind to a receptor. Let's say that receptor is a ligand-gated ion channel. Often it is, there are exceptions. If it is a ligand-gated ion channel, then what it's going to do is it's going to bind to and open this ligand-gated ion channel. By the way, when a receptor is also a ligand-gated ion channel. We call them fast ionotropic receptors. Ionotropic, as in targets, um, uh, ion targets it. Um, and what it will do is it will cause a graded membrane potential. So this goes all the way back to the membrane potentials notes. So if you open an ion channel and you're sitting at minus 70, for instance, then um, what's going to happen is ions going, are going to move down their electrochemical gradient and change the resting membrane potential from minus 70. How is it going to change? Well, it depends on what kind of ion moves, okay? So let's do two different kinds of synapses. So with this picture, since it's not labeled, I'm gonna make it do two different things for me conceptually. So let's say that this blue um, receptor right here is a ligand-gated sodium channel, right? This neurotransmitter binds to and opens a ligand-gated sodium channel. Then it will cause what polarization on the postsynaptic cell? It'll cause depolarization, which we consider excitation because it's getting closer to threshold. 
depolarization and excitation of the postsynaptic neuron. If that just occurred, I bound to and opened a ligand-gated sodium channel caused depolarization and excitation, then we can describe what's happening on the postsynaptic cell as an EPSP. Oops, EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential. Let's break that down. Excitatory because it depolarized. Depolarized what? The postsynaptic cell, and it's a potential. It's a graded potential, though. It's not an action potential unless it hits threshold. Okay, so if the EPSP hits threshold, you'll get an action potential on the postsynaptic cell. Okay, so this would be, in that instance, an excitatory synapse. Cool? Okay, but not all synapses are excitatory. Sometimes you want to stop the postsynaptic cell from having an action potential. So let's use the same picture and imagine something different. If instead of this receptor being a ligand-gated sodium channel, let's say that this receptor, different place, not the same receptor, conceptually, this is a ligand-gated potassium channel, okay? So what would happen here is when the neurotransmitter is released and binds to and opens a ligand-gated potassium channel, right, then potassium would move down its electrochemical gradient and what it would cause is hyperpolarization because we know that potassium wants to move out of the cell, hyperpolarizing the cell. That would move the um, membrane potential further away from threshold, right? Hyperpolarize it and therefore inhibit. That is a way that you can turn off or down the postsynaptic cell. What in that instance, if this were again, opening a ligand-gated potassium channel, you would call this an IPSP, an inhibitory, because you got further away from threshold, postsynaptic, because that's where it occurred, potential, still a graded potential, not an action potential. You're not getting anywhere near threshold. This is how one neuron can turn another neuron off, okay? So, um, FYI, for those of you who like thinking about this stuff, you don't have to use potassium to turn a postsynaptic neuron off. You can also open chloride channels and make chloride move in, which would hyperpolarize the cell as well. Um, so, chloride move in, is that right? Chloride move in. Yeah, I think that, that works. Um, so, clinical connection here. Um, epilepsy um, is a condition in which neurons, for whatever reason, genetics, injury, a bunch of different things, fire abnormally and inappropriately. And sometimes you need to have a medication that will make them chill out. Do not fire abnormally and inappropriately. Um, there is a category of drugs that include one called primidone that actually hyperpolarize your neurons and make them less likely to fire in, um, inappropriate action potentials. But they also make them less likely to fire appropriate action potentials. So sometimes people don't, um, they aren't very compliant about this medication because it makes you feel like foggy mentally and like um, lethargic physically. And so they'll go on the medications and then the frequency or intensity of the seizures will decrease and then they'll go off the medications and go back on again. Okay, so regardless of the type of receptor that we just said, the neurotransmitter that we released caused a graded potential on the postsynaptic cell. If it was a depolarizing graded potential, in our first example, it could set off an action potential if it hits threshold, okay? But then, then we're done. Like, we got done talking from here to here. And so now what we have to do so that we can, for instance, repolarize the next one and get the next signal is we have to get rid of the neurotransmitter that was released. So now let's talk about how you get rid of the neurotransmitter. The reason you have to get rid of the neurotransmitter, by the way, is that um, remember back from the membrane potentials, we said there's no strong or weak action potentials. The way that you communicate intensity is by frequency of action potentials. So if this one was trying to say, hey, 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 tell the postsynaptic one, you can only uh, understand frequency coding if this neurotransmitter does its job and then goes away so that you can tell that the next one is coming. So you have to rapidly remove the neurotransmitter from the synapse and there are several ways to do this. 
First off, um, if you're not in a super hurry, you can just wait for the neurotransmitter to diffuse away, which is what you're seeing with number eight there. Or sometimes the presynaptic cell will reuptake the neurotransmitter so that you can recycle it and reuse it. Um, the whole neurotransmitter gets reuptaken. This is a really common mechanism of removal that we'll talk about when we talk about dopamine and serotonin and norepinephrine. It's a really common way to remove it from the synapse. Um, another way that we saw when we looked at skeletal muscle um, was um, an enzyme present on the postsynaptic cell membrane breaks down the neurotransmitter so that it can't activate the receptor anymore. Um, and that's what you're seeing in number six here. Um, so re remember acetylcholine esterase did that for acetylcholine at skeletal muscle neuromuscular junctions. And then there's another one we'll learn that um, is responsible for breaking down norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine at some synapses. And that one's called monoamine oxidase. So I'm just giving you these now. We'll learn them again in a few minutes when we... Um, when we do the neurotransmitters. And then although it's not so shown on this picture, um, they did figure out a few years ago that astrocytes, those glial cells that you have in this CNS, will sometimes like act like a ball boy and take the neurotransmitter out of the synapse and usually give it right back to the presynaptic cell, which is really cool. But we don't know that much about that yet. Okay. Um, that's it for this one, and I'll start the neural integration and summation in the next one. Here's the animation that I promised you. Action potentials arriving at the presynaptic terminal cause voltage-gated calcium ion channels to open. Calcium ions diffuse into the cell and cause synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter molecule. Acetylcholine molecules diffuse from the presynaptic terminal across the synaptic cleft and bind to their receptor sites on the ligand-gated sodium ion channels. This causes the ligand-gated sodium ion channels to open and sodium ions diffuse into the cell, making the membrane potential more positive. If the membrane potential reaches threshold level, an action potential will be produced.